Welcome to the God for Us broadcast. And hey, Merry Christmas to you and Happy New Year. I want you to know that we will be having service at the upper room today on Christmas Day. We do not believe at the upper room that the way you celebrate Christ's birthday is by canceling the Lord's Day service. So we will be here. Service starts at 1030. Our praise and worship. The actual service begins at 11 and we are going to have church today at the upper room. So come on out. Come on out. Come on out. Put, put the coffee down. Hey, save the opening of that gift until after service and come on out and be a part of the upper room church of God in Christ for we Christ masters that's what Christmas originally the original etymology of the word Christ masters we gathering in the name of Christ we're going to be having church today I want you to come out but whether you come or not Merry Christmas to you we love you and may God's choice blessings be yours To fully understand the text is to remember that the book of Habakkuk is unlike most all other books in the Bible in that the book of Habakkuk is a book written by a prophet who throughout the entirety of the book never addresses the people. Nor does God throughout the entirety of the book of the prophet Habakkuk address the people of Judah, the southern kingdom. The book of Habakkuk is different because the book of Habakkuk is a quarrel, quarrel, a argument, a backing and forth between the prophet Habakkuk and the Lord. It is Habakkuk telling it, telling God about how awful the people of Judah are. And God's response to Judah's awful, sinful condition but God responded in a way that Habakkuk did not see coming. So when the Lord gave his remedies to the problems that Habakkuk did see, Habakkuk got upset with God because Habakkuk did not agree with the way God chose to solve the problem. Now there's a lesson to be learned from this. We're taught in the scriptures to humble ourselves. Humble ourselves. Humble yourselves, the Bible says. You never, you will not find one scripture in the Bible where we are told to pray for humility. Scripture says, humble yourselves. It is not wise to pray for humility. It's wise to humble yourself. Because if you pray for humility, the means that God may use to humble you may be means that you would have never volunteered for. So rather than humbling you like he did Job who lost his seven sons and ten seven sons and three daughters in one day lost his fortune and within two days his wife also and his health why not just humble yourself keep the kids 
Keep the wine. Keep the fortune. Keep your health. And just submit yourself unto God. And resist the devil and he will flee from you. Amen. Bible teaches that tribulation worketh patience. This is why when, if you pray for patience, know that you're praying for trouble. I was asking God to give me patience, and Pastor Eric, all of a sudden everything went wrong. He answered your prayer. Tribulation worketh patience. Patience gives you experience. And as you get experience in God, experience gives you hope. And hope reassures you that God won't let you be made ashamed. So this book is an argument between the Lord and his prophet. Are you with me? The book of Habakkuk shows that ain't nobody God but Yahweh. No one is God but the God of the, prof of, of the Bible. Not even um, God's prophets do not control the Lord. The Lord controls the prophet. Amen. Amen. This is a lesson that we too must learn. He's God. He's in control. I want so badly to tell all those marchers in the streets, go home. That's an exercise in futility. You're not going to accomplish anything. You're going to accomplish by as much as they accomplish kneeling during the pledge of uh, the national anthem. They're done with that. As soon as the ratings drop, all of a sudden the NFL said, we got to fix this. It was cute for a minute. What did it change? What national conversation have we had? Meaningless. Vanity. Don't backslide. The Lord is in charge. God knows what he's doing. All you have to do is look through spiritual eyes. You don't like what I'm saying, but I'm telling you the truth. The prophet Isaiah, 91 years prior to the prophet Habakkuk, dealt with a similar situation. And when God gave the remedy to the situation, it ushered in a false fad that took hold in the body of Christ for a little while. It didn't last very long because people saw that it didn't work. Like Habakkuk, God did something with Isaiah that the prophet and the people didn't agree with. In Isaiah chapter 41, as I lay this foundation. Actually, if you go back to chapter 44 and verse 28, you will read something that is astonishing. Isaiah 44 and 28 says, well, 27 says, that says to the deep, be dry, speaking of God. And I will dry up thy rivers that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasures, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple, thy foundations shall be laid. This is an astonishing passage of scripture. Here is the Lord saying 150 years before Cyrus is even born that he would raise up a Persian king named Cyrus and that he would use this Persian king to rebuild the temple that is at Jerusalem. And what's amazing about the God of the Bible 
is that the God of the Bible is so specific that he calls him by name. He says, not only will I raise up the Middle Persian Empire and use a Persian to rebuild the Temple of Solomon, which by that time would be the Temple of Zerubbabel, he says, I'll tell you what his name will be. His name will be Cyrus. If you read the book of Ezra, amen, if you read Hagar, you read all of these books, you read about how Cyrus and the Persians conquered the Babylonians and how it was Cyrus who freed the people from Babylonian captivity to go back down to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. Just as the prophet wrote 150 years before Cyrus was born. Nobody is God but the God of the Bible. He called Cyrus his shepherd. That's astonishing for to call a Persian king who worshiped the false god who only recognized the God of the Bible as being the God of Jerusalem to call him his shepherd. And, and, and in that sense, the shepherd was an honored title was difficult for Israel to hear. For Israel was so rebellious that he could not use a Hebrew. He could not use a Jew. He had to go to a Persian. I'm wondering, can God still use an African American? Can God use any of us? Or does the Lord have to reach out beyond us? Can God use an American? We talked about this in our 8 a.m. class. Whereas we call Putin a killer and all those other things. But when America was embracing all things LGBT, Putin outlawed it in Russia. When America was bringing the hammer down on churches and even the president criticizing churches, Putin was opening churches and strengthening churches in Russia. God ought not to have to use a heathen to do what his people ought to do. That is one of the phenomenons with Trump. All that you criticize him for, he can give you a whole lot to say. He still was the only presidential candidate who spoke up for unborn babies. And it's amazing that it was a man who spoke for the babies when it was a woman who said, let them be aborted up until the water breaks. That's something weird. There's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. Say what you will or may. Funny hairdo, loud mouth and all that. But he was still the only presidential candidate that I've ever heard in my life single out Christians and say the Christians have been mistreated in this country. When the one candidate that most black preachers sold their souls for, when he got reelected the second time, didn't even uh, get a black preacher to pray at the inaugural. And by that time, Maya Angelou had died and replaced her with a Latino homosexual to read the poem at the second, at his second inaugural. Then a cussing man had to come up and say more in favor of our church. And the church 
than people who you think would have. The bigness of God. How the Lord uses whomsoever he will is an amazing thing to me. I told them in the 8 o'clock class, stop reading the Bible and reading it with, through small lenses. Stop reading the Bible and making it all about you and your cold and your cough. The God of the Bible moves nations. The God of the Bible controls everything. The God of the Bible says to one leader, stand up. The God of the Bible says to another, stand down. And whatever the Lord says, it shall be. He called Cyrus his shepherd. And in chapter 45, he calls Cyrus, now this is amazing, his anointed. Verse 45, verse 1 says, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus. Anointed. Anointed. A, a title heretofore Reserved for Israel and Jesus. And yet he calls a wicked Persian king. His anointed. You know why? Because he couldn't find any Hebrews. Couldn't find any Jews who would do right. Isn't that something? He said, Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden. I gave him power to subdue nations before him. I will loose the lions, the loins of kings to open before him the two leveled gates and the gates shall not be shut. And this actually describes, I won't go into the details of it now, how he actually conquered uh, the Chaldeans. Uh, they redirected the river, came up on a dry river bed, the gates were left open, and Cyrus and his army walked in. God said how he would win 150 years before he was born. Ain't nobody God but the God of the Bible. When the people heard what the Lord said about Cyrus, Israel got mad. And they said this to the Lord. They, they argued with God. Ah, oh, you can't do that. You can't use Cyrus. He doesn't serve you. He doesn't serve you. He doesn't know you. His God is not true. His God is a, is a he's into witchcraft. He's a Persian. No way. Ah, oh, you're not going to use him. The Lord responded to them in verse 9 of Isaiah 45. I'm going to preach in a minute. God's response was, Woe unto him that strive with his maker. Who are you to argue with me? Let the part shares of the, strive with the part shares of the earth. That is, let the clay parts argue with the clay parts. So you got to know your place. You got to know your role. Let humans argue with humans. Am I preaching? Let the, let the uh, uh, pot shares of the earth argue with them. And shall the clay say to, uh, to him that fashioneth it, what maketh thou? This is a rhetorical question. No. If you put some clay on the wheel and you spin the wheel and put a little water on it and make the clay soft and you're shaping the clay, the clay doesn't speak out and say, what are you making? The clay works with the program. He's the potter. We are the clay. Good God Almighty. Are you with me? Mm hmm. Uh, look at this. Uh, what maketh thou or thy work? He hath no hands. That is, when you're out laboring, do, do, do your work say, the, when you're out there working in the garden, whether you're doing a good job or not, does the garden say you have no skill? No, whether you know what you're doing or not, the, the grass, the, the, the grass gonna gonna do what you want it to do, 
If you trim the hedges, you can, you can mess them up, but they're going to be messed up. But they won't say anything because you're in charge. Verse 10, woe unto him that saith to his father, what begettest thou? Will the baby that's being born say to his daddy, what are you doing? <laughs> no. Or to the woman, what hast thou brought forth? Nope. It doesn't happen. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his maker, ask me of the things concerning my sons, and concerning the works of my hands, command ye me. Now, those who read the Bible out of context, a lot of the Word of Faith guys, took this scripture and lifted it out of context and said that you can command God. God says concerning my word, command ye me. So people started commanding God. Look, God, you better send me a blessing by Monday. I got one question. How did that work out for you? <laughs> Guarantee you that, did, that, won't, that didn't work. See, because the finite can't command the infinite. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Lord rebuked them for trying to command him. The point is, God knows what he's doing. Am I right about it? The prophet Habakkuk made the same mistake. Our text describes Habakkuk's second lament. Amen. In this lament, the prophet accuses God of acting contrary to his name. Here in our text, Hear me now, beautiful words are used to express the prophet's profound disappointment, disagreement, and disapproval of God's stated plans. Now, I intentionally read the text to you in a manner that would not relay to you uh, the meaning of the text. Now, I'm going to read, not all of it, but I'm going to read the prophets. Second lament to you, the way that he actually said it. So you will see that he used flowery speech to literally abuse God out. He spoke to the Lord in a manner that was condescending. And he wanted the Lord to know that he did not approve at all of God's plans. He said in verse 12, Art not thou from everlasting to everlasting? He says, Art not thou from everlasting? O oh Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. He's rebuking God because the Lord just finished telling him in his first response, if you go back and read verse 5 through 9, that I'm getting ready to raise up the Chaldeans and they're going to kill a bunch of you. So he defies God and says to the Lord, O oh Lord, art thou from everlasting to everlasting? O oh my God, O oh Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die, O oh Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. Almighty God, thou hast established them for correction. What? These are the people you're going to use to judge us. You're going to use them as though he's better than they are. Because the Lord says, I'm going over to that hasty nation, the Chaldeans. Uh, Habakkuk says, those killers. Those heathens, we're better than they are. And you're going to use them to judge us? My, 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 my. He says uh, to the Lord in verse 13, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look upon iniquity. Wherefore look thou upon them? that deal treacherously and hold your peace when the wicked 
devour a, a man that is more righteous than he. He says, Lord, how in the world can you stand back and be quiet and let the wicked devour a man who is more righteous than he? You're holy. You're God. You're my rock. You're my mighty God. You're too holy for this. It's like somebody telling you off by reading you all of your credentials. Then at the end say, how could you be so stupid? That's what the prophet was doing. Telling God you're holy, you're this, you're that. You're my rock, you're my king. And you're going to use them? You're going to do what? These people are no good. What is the lesson I want you to learn from this? Don't let someone else take your place. Amen. Walk in the anointing that the Lord has given you. Praise the Lord. Do what God has placed in your hand. Because the Lord, ain't no telling who God I can raise up. I don't want nobody else to have my anointing. I don't want anyone else to play the role that the Lord has for me to play in the kingdom. Mm -mm. I want to play my own role. Amen. I want to do what God has placed me here to do. Thank you, Jesus. And you want to do the same. Rebecca said, Thou make, said, says, they make men like fishing of the sea, creeping things that have no ruler. In other words, he was describing, he used the, 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 a fishing metaphor to say, Lord, these people, they shoot folk like they are fish in a barrel. They destroy folk and, and they, they kill them and the people can't even respond to them. These Chaldeans are fierce. They are fierce killers, and they catch them up with their hook, and they ring them in in their dragnet. And, Lord, these people devour nations as though nations are nothing, and as though people are like fish. There is no way you're going to use them to chasten us. And not only, Lord, do they do this, but when they devour nations, they won't give you credit. They won't give you praise for it. They will praise their own nets. They will sacrifice to their own nets. They will not bring any glory to you. This plan that you have to straighten us out, Lord, is not a good one. I don't agree with this at all. Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day.